in the dilemma that he found himself. He had not done anything to get there. In fact, he was just caught in a wrong time, at the, in, in a wrong place at the wrong time. He was, they called him the governor, but he was not even a governor. He was a prefect. He was an interim governor. Caesar had brought him into that place for a particular summer, for a particular time, spring into the summer. He was just a substitute. He was an interim. He was just trying to get to retirement. He was just trying to live through this one more assignment that he had been given because you didn't turn Caesar down when he gave you an assignment. So he didn't ask to be in this unrest. And he was under the microscopic scrutiny of Caesar because there was a lot of unrest brewing in Jerusalem and in Israel at that time. And he was charged with the responsibility to keep the peace, whatever it took to keep the peace. And he was just seeking to fulfill his job and get through it. Caught in the middle between an autocratic dictator boss, Caesar, and an angry mob and a crowd who were constantly stirred up about crazy religious laws and things that they had given themselves to them. Pilate had no doubt heard the news about Jesus. He had heard the reports about Jesus doing some miracles. He had never met him. He didn't know what to make of it all. And now some guy had, had, had come and he had found himself riding on a donkey on Palm, what we call Palm Sunday, rode into the city and the crowds were cheering and they were screaming and hollering and singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That was a potential problem. That was a potential problem. Just what kind of a king was he seeking to be? And if that theory, that conspiracy theory had gained any traction in, his, in, in the crowd, what would that become and Pilate was a bit concerned. He knew that King Herod had the supreme authority. But ultimately, he would have to deal with the issues if they were brought to him. He could only hope that this would all blow over. And he could just finish out his assignment. It did blow over. But not in the way that he had anticipated in his life. In fact, it became a stickier dilemma requiring an impossible decision than he could have ever dreamed about. It was not even a week later that this same crowd who was cheering Jesus in a parade begins to find themselves gathered at the courthouse in a trial. These same people, an angry mob, are screaming now, crucify him, crucify him. It was just, just wrong. It was a trial in the court systems of the judicial system of Rome. It would have to mean that somebody has actually committed a crime. What was the crime? What would it be? Who? Mysterious dilemma that we find ourselves in. And, and in the service, it's easy for us as readers 2,000 years later. It's difficult for us to cut through the confusion and assign some kind of guilt. Oh, but we can do it because we're after the fact. We can read the story of the scripture and begin to understand who is culpable, who's guilty, and who's, who's in trouble, and who's caused this. But the scripture doesn't make it easy if you were there in the crowd. I want you to place yourself in the, in the masses. The confusion at the courthouse of Pilate. The public exposure. The numerous court experiences that usually in the judicial system as we know it. Takes months and months and maybe even years to get through the court systems. But all of this many trials happens within a 12 hour period for Jesus. The examination, the cross examination, the legal briefs. All of it happens Quickly. And I don't know if you've noticed in the story that we'll read here in a moment that no one is actually clearly identified as guilty until the last. 
It's like the experience my colleague, uh, Pastor Brian Chappell, recounts about his mother who used to make real pudding even in the days when instant pudding was beginning to come out. She would go back to the old real pudding where you put the ingredients, the special ingredients of milk and eggs and chocolate and boiled it right down to the right consistency. And then you would place it in a refrigerator to set up perfectly and you'd bring it out and decorate it with sprinkles and candles and whipped cream. Real pudding. You ever had real pudding? And one night she made the pudding and she chilled it and then she brought it out to set on the table in a family of six children. Some point in the afternoon, the pudding was setting up and the, somebody, one of the six kids, came in and took their thumb and made a pudding lollipop out of it. Nobody knew who. So the mother of six children lines them all up and says, who did that? And as Brian puts it, like a junior choir singing in unison, all in a vo innocent voices said, together, not me. And there was suddenly in the minds of five of those six children a great need for justice. They did not want to be implicated as the ones who were doing it and and you know how that is. We don't, we, we don't want to be blamed for something that's not ours. And we want justice to be revealed unless we're the guilty ones. And then we hope that somehow it can be glossed over. We hope that somehow the finger will point to somebody else and away from us so that we can go free in our lives. So who's guilty in this story? What are we to believe? In John's record of the trial of Jesus, he leaves a lot open to mystery. I want us to take a look at that in John chapter 18, beginning of verse 28. And it reads like this, Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because he, it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if you weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Well, only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked. Jesus replied, is this your own question? Or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate said, so you are a king? Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. <laughs> What is truth? Pilate asked. And then went out again to the people and he told them, he's not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like for me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man, not this man, Jesus. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. We read this from the perspective that we already know about it, don't we? 
we already know the outcome of this. We know that Jesus is not a victim. He is one who is willingly fulfilling the Father's plan for redemption. He has willingly come to this place after they had spent a conference meeting in the, in the heavenlies before the world ever began with the triune God. They had sat, as the Bible says, before the foundation of the world. They had already decided that this scene would happen. But from that moment on, I want us to imagine you're in the crowd. You don't have all that perspective that we have. Now, think about that for a moment. You've heard a lot of stuff about Jesus. You've seen his miracles. You know about the political swirl around you. But who are you supposed to believe? What reports are you supposed to believe? What's the truth about this, this one who calls himself or that the people call Messiah who seems to fulfill, as some say, the Old Testament prophecies, maybe even become the Savior of the world. But right now, in this moment, you're not sure who he is. Put yourself in the crowd. Here at this moment, one shouting one thing and some shouting another thing, the clash of the kingdom of heaven with the secular government of the state of Rome. The conflict between the citizen and the government is in this conflict. What exactly are the charges and who's guilty? Great question. Consider Based on this record, who's guilty? Well, we know it's not Jesus. It's, it's not Jesus. Because we know the rest of the story. It's clear, isn't it? Jesus is not guilty. But it's not guilty just because we know it. But in this context of this scripture this morning, he, he's not guilty even legally in the best way that we can. He's not guilty. There's no Jewish charge that is given to him that is specified. Did you notice that in this passage? There's never an ultimate charge against Jesus. There's an ultimate verdict. There's an ultimate sentence. But there's never actually a charge. We go all the way back to John chapter 18 verse 19 where the trials. Notice that I said trials. Plural. There was more than one trial here. Multiple trials. The high priest had questioned Jesus in one of the first trials about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus had said, I've spoken openly to the world. I've taught in the synagogues. I've taught in the temples where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. So why do you ask me what I taught? Ask those who heard me what I said. They know what I said. Jesus is simply appealing to the law of Moses. Which basically said, as well as the Roman law said, that you had to have two or three witnesses in a courtroom to be able to condemn somebody and to charge somebody with that in, in, in the charges. And Jesus is basically saying, if you're going to charge me with anything, then you don't have any witnesses, you don't have any evidence, bring my witnesses in. In fact, just bring the whole crowd in. Let them be the witnesses. I don't even need just two or three. Just let the whole crowd witness. Let them decide. They heard me. And if you read that passage there, what was the result that happened to Jesus? He was just asking for witnesses, and one of the soldiers turned and slapped him silly Across the face. Literally. Verse 22 says. When he had said these things. One of the officers stood back. And says how is that you can answer the high priest in this way. Verse 23. Jesus said. If what I said is wrong. Bear witness about the wrong. But what I said is right. Why are you hitting me? Why are you striking me? Bring your charges. Tell me what I've done. And in verse 24. And in, in a the priest in charge, he sends him to the state supreme court, Caiaphas. He don't want to deal with it at the lower courts any longer. And it's hard for us in the English setting here to understand what was happening as he bumps up to the next authority. He didn't want to have to make the decision in his life. So Ananias sends him to Caiaphas. But there's no specific charges. Caiaphas finally discovers the same thing. He can't make any tales out of it. There's no specific charges against this man. And so he sends him on to the Supreme Court, Pilate. 
There's no Jewish charge specified. There's no Roman charge that will stick. Verse 29, Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation you bring to this man? What's the charge? And they answered, We don't have to tell you. We wouldn't bring him if he wasn't guilty. Verse 31, Pilate said to them, You take yourselves. And the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. They've already given him a sentence, and it's ultimately proven. There's no Jewish charge and no charge of Rome will stick. Pilate's caught in a dilemma. The Jews have no specific charge, but they've condemned him to the death sentence. So the judge and jury, Pilate himself, he decides, I've got to find some reason. And he goes into Jesus, and he begins the examination and the cross-examination. What have you done? What's the charge? What's going on here? Are you the king of the Jews? Are you a threat to Caesar? Come on, tell me, Jesus, are you really a threat? Are, are you a threat to this, this whole process? Is there anything? Give me a reason to charge you. And Jesus says, do you say this on your own accord? And there's this interchange. And Jesus said, this kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. What in the world? Are you, what, where, can you imagine? We understand that. But can you imagine? Pilate hearing that, he's thinking, UFOs, where did this guy come from? What's he talking about? What star, what planet is he off of? And obviously it became true that he wasn't challenging Caesar's turf. He wasn't claiming to be a civil emperor. And so Pilate goes back out, verse 38, and he says three times in the next few verses, into the next chapter, he says three times, this man is not guilty. I cannot find any guilt in him. I can't find guilt in him anywhere. Three times he declares him not guilty. No Jewish charge is ever specified, and no Roman charge will stick. And yet Pilate discovers the truth. What John had said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So who's guilty? Who's guilty in this passage? Is it the Jews? Oh, across the centuries there have been those who tried to blame it all on the Jews, that it was the Jews that, 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 that were guilty. They crucified an innocent, innocent man. But are you sure? Are you sure? Because John doesn't let us go easily to that conclusion here because he points out that, that they are the ones who are just protecting God. They're just fulfilling the law. They're just living in the laws of Moses which God gave to them. They're just obeying the laws of Moses which God gave to them. You remember the old law said, in the old law, that the scripture said that if anyone blasphemes and claims to be God, that they have to be stoned to death. They have to, be, they have to die. And here is Jesus. He had said one little phrase, and they were trying to find a way to trap him. And the only thing they could come up with is the time in John 10, 30, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Well, that did it. They could put that together, and they're making up stuff, and they're putting stuff together. And you know how it works when they're trying to trap you in your words. They take his words, make it all up, and determine that it's blasphemy, and he's worthy of death. And their own laws say he's worthy of death. They can't be guilty. They're just obeying their own laws. They're just following the law. How can that be wrong? And even in the following the law, they are very, very careful. Because did you notice in this passage that when they got to Pilate's courthouse, they did not go rushing into the courthouse. The Bible says they stood outside and Pilate came out to them. Why? Because they dare not at Passover go into an evil Gentile court or an evil Gentile house. So Pilate comes out to them so they can stay ceremoniously holy and clean. What a beautiful sight this is. Here they are, spiritually minded, trying to obey God and keep themselves clean at Passover so they could eat it and at the same time take care of this imposter son of God who is being crucified, but they stay holy. They're just obedient to the law. They're just doing what they need to do. 
they're not guilty. I mean, even if they made a mistake. Even if they make a mistake about this, they can always blame it on the Romans. When their children say, what happened? Oh, well, we didn't understand who he was, but it was the Romans that did it. He did it. So who's guilty? In this passage, who's guilty? If it's not Jesus, and if the Jews are simply following the laws of God that was given to them by Moses, and if they're fulfilling the script that was written for them, and it's ultimately not in their hands, why are they guilty? Who's guilty? Well, it must be, maybe it's Pilate. He's ultimately the one in charge, is he not? He's in charge of the troops, and he's in charge of everything that you see here. He's in a dilemma, but even Jesus recognizes that Pilate is just doing his job. Verse 10 of chapter 19, Pilate saying to Jesus, you won't speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him and said, You don't have any authority over me at all unless it's been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Well, even if Pilate carries some guilt, Jesus says it right there, that he's not the most guilty in the situation. Jesus is not going to allow Pilate to become the fall guy in this situation. And, and Pilate doesn't allow that to happen. It's an interesting thing about Pilate. Up until 1961, there was no evidence that we had anywhere except in Scripture that Pilate ever existed. But in 1961, somebody went to an old theater in an archaeological dig, and they turned over a seat, and there on the seat was inscribed the name of the governor, Pontius Pilate, carved centuries before. But there's no condemnation in those carvings that they found, only confirmation. And so all that Pilate is doing is honoring the Jews. He's honoring their laws. He doesn't have to, but he's honoring their laws. And as we see it, Pilate, Pilate may be flip-flopping meaningless promises. We know that. We, we understand politicians who flip-flop and say things and then change what they say and always blaming the last administration. We understand all of that. But Pilate goes out of his way to honor the Jews. Notice, as we noted a moment ago, Pilate goes outside because they can't come inside. He understands that. He, 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 he knows that. In verse 33, Pilate enters his headquarters again and called Jesus and says to him, Are you the king of the Jews? So Pilate goes out and then he comes back in to question Jesus. And then the scripture says that he goes back out. And then he goes back in. And then the scripture says, and he had him flogged. Which means that Pilate had to go back out to witness the flogging. And then the scripture says that he goes back in to his headquarters. And then he brought Jesus out. Did you catch that? Seven times. Pilate's going in and he's going out. There's some of you here this morning that haven't decided what to do with Jesus. Oh, you've made a profession of faith. You're religious. You look good. But you don't have a testimony. And the reason you don't have a testimony this morning, and a reason that you don't have a witness, and the reason you get caught when somebody wants a testimony from you is because you've never really decided in your mind just exactly who this Jesus is and how committed you want to be to him. And you're going in and you keep going out. And you go in and you go out. Because you're caught in a dilemma. You're caught in a decision you've never finalized in your own heart. You're, 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 you're hedging all your bets. You're covering all your bases. You're going in and you're going out. Your heart has never been settled. 
Pilate lived in that moment. He's really trying to be fair. He wants to be in the middle. It's not even his own law, and yet he tries to honor that law. You got to do whatever you got to do to keep the peace, right? The Jews won't give up, and Pilate is caught in the dilemma, and he tries to get Jesus off the hook, and and he declares him not guilty three times, but it doesn't work. And in verse 39, Pilate reminds them in a last-ditch effort, as a politician will do, he comes up with a last-ditch effort that could get them all off the hook if they just take it. And he says, hey, you remember that every Passover, we usually give you a gracious gift of releasing one of your prisoners that Rome has taken prisoner and we let them out of jail and we don't crucify them and we release them to you. How about I release you this Jesus? Because he's not guilty of anything. How about I I release him? I'll let him go as the custom is and you can do whatever you want, but we'll, we'll let him go. I'll even have him flogged so that you get your pound of flesh. But then let's just call it even right there. Let's just call it done. I'll give you a little bit. You can see the blood. But let's let's not carry this all the way through. He's not guilty. Chapter Chapter 19 of verse 12. From then on Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out. If you release him, you're not Caesar's friend. So to be a good Roman, Pilate honors the Roman purposes. And he tries to keep your populace in order. And he brings out Barabbas. Barabbas is an interesting figure in these stories. He's hardly mentioned. But here is Pilate making the trade-off. How about I give you Jesus instead of Barabbas? And they say, no, we want Barabbas. Who in the world is Barabbas? Pilate washes his hands of Jesus, and we're left thinking, who is this Barabbas? Is he he the guilty in the story? If it's not Jesus, he's not guilty. And if it's not the Jews, they're just trying to obey the laws of God. And if it's not Pilate, he's just trying to honor these, these, these pesky Jewish laws and trying to keep his integrity of justice by not crucifying or condemning an innocent man. He's just trying to get off the hook. He's just trying to be fair. He's trying hard. Well, then who's guilty? The only one that is condemned or called guilty in this passage, as John records it, is this guy named Barabbas. And the Bible just simply says, in John's gospel, he's a robber. Now, the other gospels bring us some some more. He was more than just a robber. He was... He was not just a robber. Oh, he loved to loot. But he loved to loot the stores after you have created a riot in the streets and rushed in. And then you take, he's an insurrectionist. And in fact, the Bible says he's an insurrectionist that has murdered people, innocent people, in riots, political riots. He's a murderer. Mark specifically tells us that. But there's something else about Barabbas that's not easy visible to us Westerners 2,000 years later. It's a great irony. You see, Barabbas means son of a father. Son of a father. That's it. Bar Abba. We know that Abba means father or daddy. This is a son of a father. There's a lot of ways that we read that in the scripture or names that are given that use the word ba, son of. And they're, they're positive. There's a purpose to them, like Barak. Barak means the son of lightning or the son of blessing. And there's Baruch, that was Jeremiah the prophet's secretary. We have Baruch. We, we, we then have Barnabas. You remember Barnabas? Barnabas, Barnabas. He's the son of encouragement, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts. 
So we see this phrase all through Scripture. But now in this phrase, this man is just called the son of a father. The implication is nobody knows who his father is, which is a big deal in the Jewish culture. You have to know who your father is. Or worse yet, you know who your father is, but you wish you didn't. And you don't want to talk about it. And nobody in the family talks about it either. It leaves you as you read that, the son of a father. It leaves you wondering what kind of a home did the son of a father grow up in? I wonder what shaped his thinking and his behaviors and what developed him that led him to become an out-of-control terrorist, an insurrectionist, a criminal, a son of a father. Maybe there was no father in his home. I wonder what happened to Barabbas, the son of a father. He's the only one that's Marked as guilty in the passage. A son of a father who's headed for crucifixion, but who is saved from that crucifixion and literally released because, oh, don't miss it, the son of the father was condemned in his place. The son of a father condemned, but is released because the son of the father takes his place. Think about it. Who's the only guilty one in the passage? The son of a father. To whom does this whole passage point? The son of a father. For whom the son of God, the son of the father, was crucified. Ah. I'm talking to some this morning. You would say you had a good father. Maybe you would say you had a wonderful father. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've made the right choices in your life, but maybe even you came from a good home and you made some bad choices in your life and you rebelled against even your parents and their faith and you rebelled against all of that and maybe you came to a place where you, your family has given up on you. In fact, they may have kicked you out of the house some time ago and they don't want you living at home anymore because of the bad choices and the lifestyle that you're living and, and you've discovered that your good father can't save you from your addictions. Your, your good father can't save you from all the trouble that you've gotten yourself in. You're the son of a father but it doesn't matter whether he's a good father or not, you've discovered that your father can't save you from your past. He can't save you from your pain. He can't bring you to salvation. He cannot give you a future. He, he cannot give you eternity. He cannot bring eternal life into your life. He, you're just a son of a father. Daddy can't rescue you. He cannot save you. I come from a home with a wonderful father who was sought to live for Jesus and sought to live for God all of my life. But there came a moment in my life when, when no matter who my dad was, I'm just the son of a father when it comes to salvation because my daddy can't save me. He can't save me from a devil's hell. He cannot get me to heaven. He did not die in my place. He did not buy my salvation. He's just my earthly father, but he can't save me. I'm just the son of a father. But I'm talking to some here this morning who may have grown up in a home where you never knew your father. Or maybe you grew up in a home in which nobody wants to talk about your father because of the lifestyle and the choices that he made in his life. Maybe he's not there because of divorce. Maybe he's not there because of war. Maybe he's not there because of death. Maybe he's not there because of separation. You don't have any reference. You're just a son of a father. Deep inside this morning is a deep hole. A very deep hole of pain and hurt and regret 
a deep hole in your heart, a deep hole in your mind. You're caught in anger. You're caught in, in the web of hurt. You've, you've tried to medicate it with drugs. You've tried to, to, to make some decisions and change your life. But it seems like it, it, whatever decisions you make, it's never good enough. You can never quite do the right thing. Maybe, maybe you've tried to come to Jesus. Maybe you have even tried to become a believer and begin to walk in the ways of God. But you can't seem to get it together. And it seems like everybody else has it. And you've watched everybody else and you're just, you just feel lost. You feel like an orphan. You, you feel like you, you're just a son of a father who has no hope for the future in your life. And you're caught in the dilemmas. Maybe you're like Pilate. You've become so callous to the whole thing that you've gotten a cold heart. You used to have a warm heart toward God and the things of God but the fact is because of life and what it's given to you and the fact you can never seem to get it right in your life you become cold and hard. It just seems like all of your decisions are the wrong decisions. Who's the son of a father? I am. And every one of you are as well. The son of a father. We are the sons and daughters of a father for whom the son of the father was crucified. Who's guilty in this passage? It's not Jesus. Oh, it's hard to point a finger too long at the Jews. You can't point a finger at Pilate. They're just trying to do their jobs. They're just trying to, to be just. They're just trying to be fair. Who's guilty? For whom did Jesus die? For whom was he crucified? It's the sons and the daughters of a father. They're the ones. We're the ones. You remember the pudding story? Brian Chappelle tells the rest of the story. Mom said, who did this? And all the kids said, not me. She was a wise mother. She wasn't a mother of six for no reason. <laughs> she lined them all up. And she said, hold out your thumbs. And she began to take the measurements of the thumbs to match the hole in the pudding. And it turned out, Brian said, to be my brother Gordon. He was the guilty one. And this morning, there's a hole in your heart. That's the size of your choices that have messed up your life. And you may feel and stand, as we all have, guilty with the thumb that fits. The choices and the behaviors that we've made, even when we're trying to do our best. And the good news this morning is that Jesus, the Son of the Father, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It was the will of God, Jesus said, that he be crucified so that he could rescue many sons and daughters of the Father. He's the spotless Lamb of God. And when we come to him, Jesus said, here's what's going to happen. If you'll come to me, the sons and daughters of a Father, to as many as believed in him and received him to them gave he the right the privilege the power to be called the children of God the sons and daughters of the father we're born into a new family there's a born-again experience. We come to belong. We come to have a purpose in the family so that the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the believers at Rome, he had said, we have been adopted as sons and daughters by which we cry, God, Abba, Father. We don't like being in the place of humility. It feels like shame when we felt so wrong most of our lives. It seems like we can't do anything right. We're just the sons and the daughters of a father. We don't like to be in a place of humility. We like to resist that. But it's at the place of confession and humility 
that we begin to find hope and forgiveness and healing and a future and a place to belong and a family. Because Jesus, the Son of the Father, gave his life for us so that we could be forgiven. The guilt removed. Sin gone. Freedom from self and sin and the law. So we begin to sing in the words of Chris Tomlin. The songwriter, there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. There's a place where sin and shame and powerlessness, where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. Or in the words of Isaac Watts' hymn, Maybe you're there this morning. Alas, and did my Savior die? And did my Sovereign die? Would He devote His sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Thus I might hide my blushing face while he, dear cross, appears, dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes with tears. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Sing it with me if you know it. At the cross. At the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. Do you remember that? It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Sing it one more time. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. And that can be your story this morning as well. Sons and daughters of a father. You can come to be sons and daughters of the father. Through Christ Jesus.